I will now turn this over to Marvin Nathan, the National Chair of the Anti-Defamation League, to give an introduction and to frame our conversation for today. Thank you, Marvin. Thank you, Tamar. I wish to thank you and the Jewish Funders Network for hosting this webinar and for collaborating with ADL to speak about the current state of white supremacism in the United States today and what that means for the Jewish community. As you have likely seen, the plan Unite the Right rally this past Sunday in Washington, D.C. was largely a non-event. Thankfully, less than two dozen protesters showed up and were far outnumbered by counter-protesters. ADL's work tracking and exposing these extremist movements and leveraging our expertise with various constituents has been at the core of the fight against this hate. I am honored to serve as ADL's national chair and I'm extremely proud of the work of ADL Center on Extremism over the past year. It's my pleasure and privilege to introduce to you today Orrin Siegel, the director of ADL Center on Extremism and a leading voice in counter-terror. After Orrin's presentation, you will have the opportunity to ask questions and I wish to invite and encourage you to take advantage of Orrin's expertise. Deb Leipzig, ADL's Vice President of Leadership will moderate the Q&A. Thank each of you for joining us today. And with that, I welcome Warren Siegel. Thank you so much, Marvin. Um, and thank you all for, for taking the time to be on this call. My goal for the next 25 minutes or so is to provide some insights uh, into recent developments in the white supremacist movement in this country, um, and also to, to underscore how uh, American Jews are not only in the crosshairs of this movement, frankly, not even the sole targets, but about how the American Jewish community is uniquely positioned to lead the fight against white supremacy and all forms of bigotry. And of course, uh, I will leave ample time to answer any questions you may have uh, after my remarks will prompt you exactly how to do that at that time. So to start, to, to, to begin the, the, the context, we are living in a time where we're consistently and constantly grappling with rising numbers of hate incidents, of public displays of extremism, and from across the ideological spectrum. You know, these trends that we're dealing with in the Center on Extremism every day are not just linked to the latest rise of white supremacy. You know, hate is not the sole domain, if you will, uh, of any one extremist movement or group. And the Jewish community in particular uh, cannot, frankly must not ignore any of the extremist threats that we face. These issues of uh, anti-Semitism and extremism and hate more broadly are part of our collective consciousness every single day. And the goal of, of, of ADL and, and in particular the Center on Extremism is not only to understand extremism and hate. You know, how are they operating? What are their tactics? How are they exploiting social media and so on and so forth? But really to find ways that we can mitigate these threats ways that we can push back on these serious issues. And again, these issues that are making headlines and seem to be leading the daily news broadcasts every day. And we push back in various ways. We provide actionable and timely information about extremist activity and their plans to law enforcement, our closest partners. We provide data and analysis uh, with the tech industry so that they can have a better understanding of those who want to exploit their services. We provide alerts and insights to communities, um, similar to a call like this, and other partners around the country every day. And you know, our stable of young specialists and seasoned experts, I have to tell you, the past couple of years, we have been more vigilant than ever in the fight against hate and extremism. You know, if I had to sort of use a phrase, we go where the hate is. And unfortunately, in the last few years, we have often had to go to many disturbing places. But any effort to fight hate and understand its core ideology, 
uh, begins with understanding the landscape and what is really going on. So before I get into how modern white supremacist ideology is you know, centered on the assertion that the white race is in danger of extinction, that a drowning, uh, 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 that it's drowning in a rising tide of non-white people who are controlled and manipulated by Jews. Let me just start with a few thoughts on what Marvin mentioned in the beginning about what we saw this past weekend in Washington, D.C. So as we approach the anniversary of the shocking and deadly events that occurred last year in Charlottesville, many people were coming to us to ask, they were wondering, will we see the same number of people that we saw last year? Will the displays of, of hatred and violence uh, happen again as they stunned the country last year? And our answer was, really for a month or so, even leading up to this event, probably not. You know, the event itself ended up being very sparsely attended, very heavily protested, and really reflected uh, the, the challenges that are facing uh, the alt-right, which in particular is, is that name, just to be clear, is, is a repackaging and, and renaming of really an old hatred uh, of the larger white supremacist movement. So the organizer of the event, whose name is Jason Kessler, he was indeed accompanied by a few dozen supporters. At least four of the attendees wore helmets, as you see on the left here, adorned with stickers promoting a group called the New Jersey European Heritage Association, which is uh, just another way of saying a white supremacist group, which we know has been distributing propaganda claiming that the white race is an endangered species and promoting the slogan, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. Let me talk about that slogan. The 14 words as it is commonly known, it's a reference to perhaps the most popular white supremacist slogan out there in the world. It was coined by a white supremacist terrorist named David Lane. It reflects the primary white supremacist worldview that unless immediate action is taken, the white race is doomed to extinction by a rising tide of color that is purportedly controlled and manipulated by the Jews. You know, this 14 words is often featured in rallies that white supremacists have around the country. They literally put it on their bodies. It's at the core of what they believe because their ideology has changed. You know, if you look at white supremacy 30, 40, 50 years ago, it was about maintaining power in this country. What the 14 words indicate is that it's no longer maintaining power, it's about fighting for the existence of the white race. And when you think you're fighting for your own existence, you will do anything that you can to defend yourself. You know, this concept is the white supremacist North Star. Indeed, this past weekend, um, we were observing those who participated in the rally, and one of them had a tattoo on her forearm that had 1488. So 14, now you know what that means. But for those who may not know what 88 means, it's the eighth letter of the alphabet. And when you put an eight and an eight together, it's HH, Heil Hitler. Oftentimes, we see 1488 together on tattoos and placards, et cetera. Now, somebody else uh, who was part of this group that attended um, also held a sign supporting an anti-Semitic wannabe politician by the name of Patrick Little. He ran for Senate in California and apparently has plans to run for president in 2020. I should note that there are dozens of candidates running for office today that are linked to white supremacists or that are blatantly anti-Semitic. This is another sign that white supremacists think that the time to strike is now, that the public may actually be somehow open to their hateful ideas. You know, white supremacist candidates is nothing new. We've seen them run for office before, but the volume and the amount of candidates this year 
the blatant uh, language that they use, whether on social media or otherwise, they're not even hiding their hatred. You know, yesterday, Patrick Nealon, a white supremacist and anti-Semitic candidate for Congress, he lost the Republican primary in Wisconsin, but he managed to pick up 11% of the vote in the state's first congressional district, which amounts to about 7,000 votes. Now, he won't win. Most of these white supremacists won't win. In many ways, this is a tactic to gain attention, but we cannot ignore those thousands of votes for blatant anti-Semites. And if we do, we do so at our own risk. So just like last year when we predicted that the events in Charlottesville would be the largest gathering of white supremacists in over a decade, we were right this time around as well. There were much fewer, but here's what led us to that conclusion and to that prediction. Our assessment was based on a significant backlash that followed the events last year in Charlottesville. And those include uh, infighting among the leaders and factions within the white supremacist movement, evictions from internet platforms, various ar arrests and, and even lawsuits. These responses clearly impacted the willingness of some white supremacists, in fact, the majority of them, to participate in the anniversary rally this past weekend in Washington. And throughout the year, since Charlottesville last year, scores of white supremacists who attended were doxxed, which means their identities were exposed online. Some were fired from their jobs, ejected from universities, shunned from family and friends. Now, in some ways, that's the good news, that there was a response and a reaction to the hatred from communities around the country. And I should note that last year, white supremacists attended Charlottesville from at least 36 different states. They were willing to travel and show their face. But we've also been observing other forms of infighting. And honestly, also internal debates over the public messaging um, and the appearance of white supremacist groups as they're trying to figure out, frankly, the best way to recruit new members. So should they avoid blatant white supremacist imagery and stress what they refer to as American patriotism? Or is it more effective to march in military style uniforms, yelling white power, waving swastika flags? You know, these are the arguments and the debates within the movement that have pushed segments of the movement farther apart and have fueled their unwillingness to work together. Again, the results of that are a much more, a much smaller uh, uh, crowd that showed up this pack, past weekend. The organizational and promotional efforts that marked so much of the lead up to last year event were nowhere to be seen this time around. Many who promoted and organized the events publicly distanced themselves from this year's event. And in particular, its main organizer, Jason Kessler, who has very little credibility within the broader white supremacist movement. So this is why a few dozen random white supremacists showed up. We were on the ground this weekend, just as we were last year. And again, we will continue to go where the hate is. But make no mistake, no matter how many people showed up at this rally, no matter how small the turnout was, the alt-right and the white supremacist threat is not going anywhere. America's white supremacist movement is not in the state of retreat, but rather in a state of regrouping. And it's a danger that we cannot overstate. You know, the alt-right was energized by a, uh, a political climate and it had explosive growth since 2015, delivering thousands of new recruits like some that you see on the screen now to the movement. Many of them were young and relatively well-educated a far cry from the stereotypes that we had about white supremacists as old men in hoods or neo-Nazis with shaved heads. That was a tactical decision that was being made. And these enthusiastic new members are unlikely to uh, uh, abandon their hateful beliefs simply because some of their leaders are fighting with each other or simply because some of them are getting booted off of Twitter or Facebook or other social media platforms. 
they still play a significant role in promoting and amplifying their message and anti-Semitism and hatred, not only nationally, but internationally. And their recruitment efforts, including unprecedented propaganda campaigns on college campuses, which I'll get to in a bit, you know, continues. Their online activity where they have weaponized, if you will, social media to harass and intimidate users continues every day. And new groups are forming and getting active, including more violent white supremacist groups. You know, for example, the Atomwaffen Division and others who are focused on street fighting. So the Atomwaffen Division is a group that promotes the idea that uh, society and government are collapsing and that democracy and capitalism, you know, have given way to Jewish oligarchs and globalist bankers, resulting in the cultural and racial displacement of the white race. The group's members have been linked to multiple violent crimes, including the killing of a gay Jewish college student in California. You know, we uh, uh, produce an annual report here at ADL where we look at these sorts of extremist related murders around the country. And last year in 2017, 59% of the extremist related murders in this country were carried out by right wing extremists. And when you extrapolate that and you look at a broader data set of say 10 years, like the graph on the screen, where 387 people were killed over a 10 year period, 71% of those extremist related mur murders were carried out by right wing extremists. Now, not all right wing extremists are white supremacists. That includes anti government, some anti abortion extremists. But the vast majority of those murders in this country have been carried out by white supremacists. In fact, when you look at the last 10 years, only one year stands out as not being. Um, led by, in terms of death toll, by white supremacists. And that was 2016 because of the horrific killing at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando in which 49 people were killed by Islamist extremists. And so again, I reiterate, we do not have a luxury to ignore any one threat. But when you look at the data and the resurgence of extremism and white supremacy in particular, remember, this is not just a, ideas that we may disagree with. These are militant, violent ideas that have on the ground consequences. Which brings us to the core of this discussion. You know, the role of anti-Semitism as animating these white supremacists. Now on the screen, you'll see a, a, um, a flyer. Uh, I encourage you not to log on to the website at the bottom of the screen. That just means I'll have to open up a file on you. Um, but again, you see that here is the fundamental power at the core of the white supremacist ideology is their loathing of Jews. They have a deep reservoir of this loathing, deep enough to accommodate, frankly, a wide range of hatreds, but they have a special status. They reserve that status among their enemies for the Jews. Although white supremacists fear and despise people of most other races, most also assume whites are very far superior to the people of other backgrounds, which raises sort of an interesting question. In their eyes, do they really have, whether they're African American or Hispanic or Muslims, the ability to threaten white dominance or survival? Well, perhaps not, but this for white supremacists is where the Jews come in. White supremacists view Jews as intelligent, as intelligent but also as parasites who control and manipulate the actions of non-white races to the advantage of Jews and to the detriment of the white race. You know, this is a long-standing anti-Semitic notion. This did not begin with the rise of the alt-right. You know, this notion of the international Jewish conspiracy, a theme that frankly is no less powerful today with the alt-right than it was in Tsarist Russia. You know, here in their own words, they talk about Jews are the eternal enemy of the white race. They need to be treated as such. They are no good. They are traitors and loyal only to their race. Any action 
that white people take to get rid of these Jews is strictly in self-defense in their view, in much the same way that you would try to destroy a poisonous sna a snake. The Jews are poisonous to the moral fabric of white society. Now that's of course in their words. And there have been several incidents of white supremacist flyers and banners and other criminal activity at Jewish institutions around the country. Their life's blood is the fear and anxiety that they can bring to those communities. And if Jews are the greatest puppet masters, they control the media in their eyes. They control the internet. They control everything required to manipulate entire peoples for their benefit. Now, there are times, frankly, we have a sense of humor in the Center on Extremism where we wish that was actually true. But, the farthest, but it is really the farthest thing from it. But white supremacists rely on that narrative. They typically believe that Jews or Jewish machinations are behind almost everything they despise and fear, including liberalism, immigration, diversity, multiculturalism. Some have claimed that the Jews control the weather. But if the Jews are the puppeteers in the white supremacist worldview, non-whites are the puppets. In particular, white supremacists in the United States focus on African Americans as the racial enemy secondarily only to Jews. They view Jews as a race. You know, using, you know, also centuries old stereotypes portraying African Americans as unintelligent, as, as primitive or, or even savage. White supremacists claim that black people are the main tools used in Jewish efforts to weaken or attack the white race. White supremacists view multiracial couples and families as a particularly heinous offense. One that has spurred a lot of deadly hate crimes in this country by white supremacists. And why is that a particularly heinous offense? Because multiracial couples and families, they view them as the visual evidence of the future existence of their white race. You know, Latinos typically perceived by white supremacists as, uh, as immigrants, you know, regardless of how many generations they or their ancestors may have been in the United States, increasingly attract white supremacist attention and hatred. American white supremacists are well aware of the demographic changes in this country, which they typically portray as an invasion. Similarly, Muslims or people who are perceived to be Muslims, you know, often uh, the Sikh community, have increasingly been the target of white supremacists who viewed their religion as foreign and as an existential threat to Western civilization. You know, the fact that many Muslims in the United States are, are non-white or, or maybe immigrants adds to that hatred. You know, look no further than the shooting at the Sikh temple in Wisconsin um, several years ago, where white supremacists attacked and killed several people um, um, there. Um, he mistaken the Sikh community for Muslims. That happens quite a bit around the country. And then even the LGBTQ community, they're viewed as sodomites and degenerates who seek to weaken the white race. But there's more. There's a robust symbiosis between misogyny and white supremacy. These two ideologies are powerfully intertwined. We recently issued a report about this very issue. Now, let me be clear, not all misogynists are racists, and not every white supremacist is a misogynist. However, based on our research, the deep-seated loathing of women very much acts as a um, connective tissue between many white supremacists, especially on the alt-right, and broader misogynistic movements. You know, our recent report actually served as a as a form of a call to action. You know, we need to start thinking of misogyny in the white supremacist movement in ways that we think of other forms of bigotry, be it racism, even anti-Semitism, because these elements that are at the core of the white supremacist movement are the indicators of hate and also the gateways into that movement. You know, the list of peoples that white supremacists hate, of course, is virtually unending. But it all in some ways comes back to the Jews who are held responsible for non-white immigration 
liberalism and any other societal change that they rage against. You know, this is important. Perhaps I would say maybe the most important thing I'm gonna say on this call, understanding this provides us with an opportunity to recognize the need and embrace efforts to build coalitions with other groups and to find allies to push back on this hatred. Because this hatred clearly impacts all of us. You know, we're motivated at ADL to help stand up for other communities that are impacted by hate. But to show where the cross section between these hatreds and the white supremacist movement are key. Because other communities fight is our fight. And our fight is the fight of other communities. You know, at the end of 2016, um, we had many reporters reach out to us because they were getting harassed online by what appeared to be a cohort of the alt-right. You know, these were reporters who were Jewish or perceived to be Jewish, um, who were being um, not just harassed, but doxxed, meaning information about where they lived, information about their families was being circulated online by this segment of the white supremacist movement in an attempt to silence them from doing their job. You know, one of the core um, findings of this study that we saw as we tried to gauge what the level of this harassment was that was going on on Twitter was that when anti-Muslim bigotry became a focus in the public discussion, anti-immigrant rhetoric, misogyny, when that increased, so did the harassment of Jewish journalists. You know, so that is only one measure to, so, to show the sort of common cause that we have. It's only one measure, but it's a powerful one. You know, and it makes sense. Don't forget that when these groups and movements and individuals of white supremacists who traditionally never got along, when they finally created a sort of co coherent movement and came together in Charlottesville last year, they were emboldened by the anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant, misogynistic rhetoric. But at the end of the day, it was the chance that the Jews will not replace us. So I can't underscore enough how recognizing this shared fight is key, which is why we're exposing the ideological underpinnings and educating the public as much as we can about this critical part of responding to hate. You know, identifying trends at the earliest stages, providing data-based analysis, um, that helps us um, not only communicate, but it's something that we're putting a priority on. Now, again, how else do we measure this rise, the, the emboldened uh, white supremacist movement? So we issued a study on white supremacist propaganda efforts on college campuses. We compared the 2016 and 17 school year to the 17 and 18 school year. And we found a staggering 77% increase in the amount of banners and flyers and speaking engagements and visits to college campuses around the country from the previous school year to the next. Now, why would white supremacists be targeting college campuses? Well, one, they want to create fear and anxiety in what would otherwise be safe spaces. But again, they view campuses as these bastions of liberalism and multiculturalism, which is so much of what they oppose. For them, it's also bringing the fight to the people, not only to recruit them, but to create fear and anxiety. And at the same time that we're seeing an increase in that particular activity from the white supremacist movement, we're seeing other frames of reference that are alarming. Our audit of anti-Semitic incidents that we do every year, where we gauge incidents and try to measure them that are reported to our 20 plus regional offices around the country, we found that there was a 57% increase in reporting to ADL on anti-Semitic incidents from the previous year. And if 57% is not a big enough number, there was a 90 plus increase in K to 12 schools. Now I want to be very clear about this. Most of the anti-Semitic incidents that occur around the country are not done by white supremacists or other extremists. You know, 
this is this form of hate is not delivered only by the most extreme to the most extreme, but through much more nuanced ways. And it's a reminder that our kids have been paying attention to the divisiveness in the public discussion. And that your average Joe and your average Jane tend to be those who are behind specific anti-Semitic incidents of swastikas on a synagogue or uh, you know, Hitler graffiti um, on a park, more so than actual white supremacists. You know, to further try to put some data behind what we're, and measure what we're, what we're seeing in the past couple of years, we decided to do a much more in-depth uh, piece of research into, you know, the platforms. Because hate today, perhaps more than any other time in human history, is a socially transmitted disease. And it's really nearly impossible to overstate the impact social media has had on our world. You know, the influence is often wielded in the service of good. Think of viral fundraising efforts or to protect democracy against authoritarian threats. I mean, being able to connect with your high school friend that maybe you lost touch with, for some, that's also considered a greater good, not always. But it can also be a, powerfully, a powerful tool to amplify society's most dangerous attitudes. Racism, sexism, homophobia, anti-Semitism, conspiracy theories of all types have very deep roots in social media. And perpetrators have recognized and capitalized on the uh, uh, you know, near universal reach of these very popular platforms. So this report that we issued was an effort to gauge the prevalence of one of these destructive prejudices, anti-Semitism on one social media platform, Twitter. You know, we frequently field reports from constituents who, you know, describe a, a, an atmosphere of, of anti-Semitism on their social media platforms, including harassment, as we mentioned with the journalism uh, report. Media reports also reflect this phenomenon as well, but we wanted to go beyond mere reporting to understand the problem in greater detail while examining you know, specific tweets for nuance and context. And so we created a, a, a query, if you will, um, leveraging our expertise in anti-Semitism, as well as bringing in statistical methods. Um, and we were able to determine that roughly 4.2 million anti-Semitic tweets were posted between January 2017 and 18. We estimate that these tweets were issued by approximately 3 million unique handles. Now, I want to say this. That number is low. I mean, 4.2 million tweets is not only a very small number out of the trillions of tweets that are sent on the platform each year, but our study only looked at the English language and text. So much of communication is happening through imagery and memes, and certainly in many, many different languages. So if you take just the English text-based study and you extrapolate to all these other venues, and by the way, other platforms, you see that this is a pretty significant problem. And it does not negate the actual experience of Jews who have found Twitter and other platforms to be a toxic environment. So this number is large enough to underscore the powerful harassment that exists um, within these environments. And this data, that we are collecting, we're using to leverage with those companies so that they can train their machines on how to learn to identify hate and extremism on their platforms. So I just want to uh, add one more element here before I conclude. And I wanna show, I think one of our latest um, uh, 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 tools and, and innovations that we've done because I think it underscores again this sort of connection between anti-Semitism and extremism. So just last week, we launched the heat map, which is essentially a visual resource and an interactive map that visualizes various data sets. It's an educational and motivational tool, we hope, for all who are committed to recognizing and fighting hate, to empowering users to better understand uh, the various manifest manifestations of hate and extremism, on both a local and a national level. It enables users 
to contextualize extremism hate. And we're committed to expanding the scope. And actually what I'd like to do is to share um, a live version of this to show you exactly what it is. So I was mentioning that white supremacist flyering around the country has elevated. And you know, on this map, you're able to select uh, various different data sets, say anti-Semitic incidents, which we can select here. And you can also select, say, white supremacist propaganda incidents. And you can do it over a period of time. You can select your city, see what's happening in your local community. But if we just choose 2016 to 2018, you will see below there are 4,135 incidents that we have tracked. And if you click on, and I'm not going to pick on any one you know, state, but let's just say Texas, you go in, and again, you can learn more about specifically where these incidents have occurred. You're also able to get more information about each one of these incidents. Scrolling down and seeing some of the propaganda that has been shared. Again, being able to really pinpoint not only where are these incidents occurring, but also what can we do about it? And so I'll conclude with this and then I'm happy to take questions. But I have to say behind each one of those bubbles that I just showed on the various data sets that we have is a story of a person, a, a family or a community that has been shattered by hate, right? We cannot forget that. But we can also, we also can't forget that each one of those stories serves as a reminder of how people can actually come together to persevere when those incidents occur, can come together to push back against that hate. I mean, this is why I very much appreciate this opportunity to speak with you. You know, through our work together, ADL, and, and anybody who is our partner, that's where we can have our greatest impact by serving as ambassadors or helping educate the public, sharing resources, but ultimately rejecting hatred you become part of that narrative behind those dots on that map. Because together, we become part of that response. Together, that's where we go. We go where the hate is. So I'm gonna conclude there. Thank you for your time and happy to take any questions you might have. Lauren, thank you so much. I, I always enjoy listening to you talk about that. The subject matter is always tough, but uh, you do so in an eloquent way, and I'm really appreciative of that. Thank you. Um, can you review how we ask questions? Yes. So at the bottom of your screens, for those of you on Zoom, um, if you hover toward the bottom, you'll see a Q&A button, and you can click on that button and then enter in, type in your question. So again, uh, for those of you on Zoom on your uh, desktops or laptops, go to the bottom of the screen. You'll see a little area that says Q&A, and you click on that, and it'll prompt you to enter in any question you might have. Great, thank you. I also neglected to introduce myself. I'm Deb Leipzig, and I'm the Vice President of Leadership at ADL. Um, I also want to thank Marvin for jumping in and uh, helping us out to do that introduction earlier. We had a volunteer leader had to have a medical emergency who had to jump out and Marvin was great and jumped right in, so thank you. Uh, I also wanna thank the Jewish Funders Network for allowing us to do this and share this work with you. It's really exciting that we're able to broaden our audiences and I'm really glad that we have the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, so Oren, can you talk for a moment about how the rise of the alt-right has been affecting anti-Semitism on campus? Sure. So, um, you know, one of the critical um, analysis points that we made was around 2016. We were saying that white supremacists were getting emboldened in ways that we hadn't seen. They were celebrating some of the public discussion that was occurring. Um, they were actively engaging um, more publicly in ways that we hadn't seen before. Again, showing their faces. I mean, a lot of times white supremacists don't necessarily want to show their face. When you have, you know, 20 year olds who are coming out um, and, and feeling like maybe there's no consequences in this moment in time, um, that was striking. And so it's one thing to say white supremacists were emboldened. It's another thing to try to 
to show that and measure that. And that's why we really started focusing on white supremacist efforts on college campuses. Um, where again, we saw an unprecedented level of recruitment efforts in some ways, where they're posting flyers, they're having events. I mean, Richard Spencer, perhaps the most well-known uh, leader of the alt-right, actually had a, a tour, a college tour. He went to um, University of Florida and in Michigan um, and ended up having to stop because it was getting so much, um, not that many people were showing up. Um, and there was a lot of fighting in the, in the streets, frankly. Um, but the fact that we saw 77% increase from the 2016 to 17 year to the 17, 18 school year demonstrates that it's a real focus for white supremacists because they want to provide new recruits to their movement, young new recruits. They're hoping that, you know, some people who may have issues with sort of a PC culture, uh, let's just say that is on college campuses, that they're able to tap into any anxieties around that. But of course, ultimately, they view the, the diversity and multiculturalism of campus as a threat to the white race. Um, and so again, it's, it's the, the focus on campus has been to try to find new recruits and to find ways um, to create anxiety and fear on college campuses. That's really interesting. Um, he, we have another question. Um, very interesting. Uh, the question is, uh, what are the reasons for the increase in, in white supremacists, uh, excuse me, in white supremacy? How do you see that? Yeah, you know, white supremacist movement, you know, there are various different resurgences over time. It sort of ebbs and flows. You know, we saw this in the early 80s, mid 80s, where skinheads became, uh, again, also a younger demographic started entering the movement through the hate music scene. Um, you know, at that time, the country was going through some financial, you know, problems, depressions, et cetera, um, alienation. And, and so you saw that rise. And I think we're seeing some of that today as well. Uh, you know, I often, there's a statistic that I read and I believe it to be true. And I actually looked it up, what the most common um, occupation is in, I think it's 32 states. And the answer is driver, you know, truck driver, Uber driver, delivery driver, I mentioned that not to be completely random, but to say that, you know, we are in a moment where there are going to be self-driving cars as a reality in this country. And what happens to those people whose skills are no longer needed? And so you have a generation of people who feel alienated. Uh, automation, um, changes in society have impacted them. And like anybody, they're trying to find a way to explain away perhaps the alienation that they feel. Stereotypes have always been there to help people um, make sense out of their lives. And so you combine that with, I believe, a very divisive presidential campaign, which sort of amplified the type of, um, you know, anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim type of rhetoric, misogyny that also feeds into these groups. And by the way, that's not my guess. They had celebrated it throughout. And then you have social media where legitimate news exists literally in the same space as hateful fake news. And those have all contributed to the resurgence that we are in right now. Thank you. Um, so here's another question. Uh, what is ADL's strategy for working with other affected communities? Are they open to overture? It's a good one. Absolutely. So, you know, ADL has 26 regional offices around the country and you know, one of the, the incredible, I think, sort of frontline jobs that our regional offices do is stand up with communities when they are impacted. You know, there's an arson at a mosque, a shooting in an African-American community at a church, or any type of hate incident. Our regional offices are there to offer support, not only to those communities that are impacted to say, you're not alone, but also we provide information on extremist threats that impact all communities to law enforcement. We're training them on how to recognize criminal activity and extremist threats that impact every single one of the communities that we're trying to work with. So, you know, reaching out and working with other communities is not just sort of something that we hope for, but we recognize is a necessity to 
back again. Yeah. I just recommend that somebody uh, maybe mute their phone. I'm hearing a, a little. Okay. Um, so here's another question. Uh, would you talk about the approach social media companies are taking around hate speech? Has ADL been involved with these strategies and are they working? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, for, for several years now, we've been uh, organizing a cyber hate working group. And what that has done is bring together um, some of the leading companies uh, in social media, like Facebook and Twitter, other companies like Twitter, uh, excuse me, like Microsoft and Yahoo and others. And really for the first several years, it was almost like an AA meeting where, you know, you have to admit that you have a problem before you can try to deal with it. Yeah. Um, but the good news is that, you know, in the last year, frankly, especially since Charlottesville, these platforms have been in lockstep in terms of, of taking a stand you know, that they will not allow their services to be exploited by extremists. Well, it's not perfect. They have a long way to go. And one of the things that we've done through our Center on Technology and Society, which is located in Palo Alto, is bring together the engineers behind these platforms, and not just policy people because we can help by leveraging the data that we're collecting to train their machine to more preemptively deal with the hate on their platforms. So I believe that they are committed to dealing with this threat and they are going to rely on ADL more than ever to understand what these extremists actually sound like and how they actually use those platforms. Thank you. All right and here's another uh well, it persists. Thanks so much for the important research and intel. How does ADL think about how its analysis could be utilized to have an impact on the state of white of, of hate and white supremacy? Are there specific policy proposals, recommendations, either for implementation by ADL or other organizations? That's a great, a great, great question. Um, most of the reporting that we do um, includes uh, policy recommendations that are specific to the issue at hand. So, for example, when we do a report about the level of anti-Semitism on Twitter, it comes with a whole set of policy recommendations for the industry to help them sort of uh, basically for us to demand and for the public to demand that they take those issues more seriously. We have recommendations for law enforcement. You know, one of the, the issues that I think is just going to explode over the next several years is that you're more likely to come across or hate symbols on your phone than you are in your neighborhood. If somebody's being harassed, say, online, um, their first call is going to be to local law enforcement. Hey, somebody's threatening me. What do I do? And I'm not so sure law enforcement agencies are yet really prepared to be able to provide a set of tools to respond. And so one of the recommendations that we have is to you know, bolster laws that are dealing with hate speech online, making sure that law enforcement takes these this eventuality that is occurring now and creates processes so that they can better deal with that intake. We have to encourage our government, frankly, to understand more accurately the threat of extremism. You know, we've taken a stand against, um, or rather for, a more holistic approach to dealing with violent extremism. A lot of the focus has tended to be on Islamist extremists. And that, by the way, that's a very significant threat that we report on. But if you're really going to um, use government to fund programs that will help um, uh, uh, secure the safety and security of communities, you can't ignore any one extremist threat over the other. And perhaps those, are, those and other policy recommendations we can you know, share with the group after this call as well. Great. Thank you. Uh, I think one last question, and uh, it's what do you anticipate these numbers of incidents are going to look like in 2019? Hmm. So, um, you know, we're right now we are trending upward, um, but you don't do the work that we do at ADL, whether you are Marvin Nathan, whether you are Deb Leipzig or Oren Siegel, or somebody who just started two weeks ago without having hope that things will get better. And so while we're cautious and prepared for propaganda efforts to continue, for social media harassment to keep going, for other events to occur, 
we are also believe that through our exposure, our efforts to disrupt by educating the public and by creating allies with different communities, that the numbers can actually go down. So we're always gonna be optimistic, but we're gonna be also prepared if things go the other way. I like that answer. That was a good one. A little political, a little positive. I thought it was good. Thank you, Oren. Um, I think those are all the questions. I, I, I'm really uh, appreciative to everyone who joined us today and to Oren and to Marvin and to JFN. And uh, we're really grateful and uh, thank you. Thanks a lot.